Welcome in, everyone. It is Thursday, November 18th. I am your host, Mark Real, and welcome to State of the Family Courts. Tonight, we have a very special guest, uh, an attorney practicing in the state of North Carolina. She's the owner of A&R Law Offices um, in Greenville, Raleigh, uh, Beaufort, and, uh, North Carolina. Uh, she speaks and advocates nationwide about divorce culture, wellness, shared parenting, and professional human resource development. She's also the author of a book, uh, The Cure for Divorce Culture, and has her own podcast, Divorce Healthy. So I uh, want a uh, special welcome to Ashley Nicole Russell. Ashley, thank you for coming on tonight. Thanks so much, Mark. It is awesome. I know that uh, you and Casey have been, or your your Casey's been communicating with you guys for a long time to get you on. Um, yes. It's exciting because another piece uh, of your puzzle is you do sit on the board for National Parents Organization, uh, yes. which we talk about every single week and does phenomenal <laughs> work, uh, specifically with the state polling. I know that's been instrumental in several states getting laws passed. Um, so. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll we'll hop right in. So, um, the state of North Carolina, the 2019 scorecard gives North Carolina a D minus. So, yeah, not not <laughs> great. Sa same as the state of California, where I'm at, has. Uh, so, what goes on on the ground in North Carolina? What what are some of the issues? What do you see day in and day out? The biggest issue is that both parents have 100% custody. So, you know, if two people separate. Um, immediately both parents have 100% custody and that leads to a lot of problems where, you know, the, they'll volley the child back and forth and, you know, picking up from daycare, one will take the child and say, well, I'm not bringing them back. And then the other one, and, and technically you can do that until some sort of order is entered. Um, and that leads to a lot of ex parte filings and, uh, other issues where, you know, people are just trying to get into court to, to have someone call who who's going to get to do what because you can't have 200 percent of a human so that's a problem it's a huge problem really and so if we were to have shared parenting as soon as two people separate well everybody knows what the rules are it's 50 50 and then it's just it's a lot easier you know it's just a lot easier for people to understand until they can go to court and then at that point if they wanted to change it um or if the judge wanted to change it but it just gives everybody an understanding in that interim time and mm -hmm. I think that that is so important. I think that beyond that is incredibly important too. And I'm an advocate for a lot of things there, but that's harder to get a consensus of everyone on. So absolutely though, that interim time until a decision is made, we need to have shared parenting. And so right now, North Carolina has a bill, House Bill 186. It's in Judiciary Committee 2. Um we will probably have to see this again in another year, unfortunately, based on the climate in North Carolina. But we are uh, pretty prepared for that to have major moves moving forward over the next couple of years. This coming year, we have a, a budgetary year and then we have to come back. So um, I think that we're really going to have a lot of help and things are moving. The pendulum is swinging. It's doing very good. We, I've made a lot of work in the state. I have firms in almost every aspect of the state now providing collaborative mediation and alternative dispute resolution processes so people can avoid litigation if possible. Um, and in, in all of those scenarios, you know, shared parenting is, in, is the, the use of shared parenting and the rate of shared parenting in a collaborative mediation and settlement negotiation setting is a lot higher than out of litigation. Yeah, definitely. I think two points you made there that, that I think are, are very common when it's the situation prior to getting in court out here, you may be three to four months before you get in court. And like you said, until you get in court, in theory, both parents have 100 percent custody in North and, Carolina. It could be over a year before you get into court. Oof, that would that would be rough. And, and I find the situation is usually if you can get something resolved quickly, that that's that's the best situation for everyone and that prevents those high conflict situations but Absolutely. the lack of rules up, upon separation uh lend itself to people trying to jockey utilizing domestic violence or other allegations to gain an upper hand Absolutely Yeah and then I think the one one of the one of the topics that, that I guess I'm most interested in maybe this is selfish in me um, not knowing much about this area is that you focus a lot of your practice on collaborative divorce. Mm -hmm. Why is that? And then what is collaborative divorce? 
So my parents had a pretty terrible divorce and that's what got me into all of this. I think all of us are personally driven in one way or another. And so my practice really focuses on what happens to these children after the litigated divorce. And so um, what I found whenever I was in law school, I actually got a dispute resolution institute certification and I was a um, when I was an undergrad, I was actually a district court mediator. So I've been in ADR since before I even had a degree. And so um, I've really tracked ADR and, and everything that I found in ADR was all of what my family needed, which was conflict resolution and management skills of how to appropriately diffuse conflict. And then additionally, when I went to law school, I really kind of saw that they were teaching me a lot of things that had a lot of destructive effects on my family. And so the two of those things synthesized together um, when I was introduced to collaborative family law, I was like, wow, this is exactly what the answer could be for a broken system of family law in many of the states in, in the country. And, and I think that it's important for these next generations of children for us to be able to focus on what's happened. Why are, are we at the lowest marriage rate of all of recorded history? Why do we have, you know, of school shootings? A lot of them are from single parent homes and litigated divorce? Why is the substance abuse and alcohol abuse rate so much higher for children out of litigated and high conflict divorce? And then to think about what that's going to happen, what's going to, what that's going to cause for the generations to come after that. So if we can be what's called a generational change breaker, chain breaker, we can start to, you know, reduce what happens to children over time. And that's a really big goal of mine because, I find myself to be a pretty strong person. I've done a lot in life. I have three different law firms, but what happened during my childhood with my parents? I mean, I still deal with that every day. So does my husband. Like, you know, it's like, it's kind of amazing how it really does affect you. And if you start to pay attention, like my husband's family is completely intact. Amazing. Honestly, I didn't even know stuff like that existed in America. And so, um, and he, you know, was was really not a part of this industry whenever we met. And now that he has been, when he watches like TV, sitcoms, movies, it's everywhere. Everybody's, you know, every character that you see in a movie where they talk about the divorce in some way, shape or form is having some issue because of their parents' divorce long term in a new relationship. And you're like, wow, it's it's very pervasive. And I think that's why I really, you know, am passionate about changing it. Yeah, definitely. And, and I actually... Uh, a couple of weeks ago, looked into it because I wasn't even aware of if California had the same mechanisms North Carolina does. Yeah. We do, in fact, have similar language. Yeah. Uh, but I have never once, um, and I've been involved in the family court system now for four and a half years, never once have I heard collaborative divorce said by, by you anyone Do you want to know why? Do you want to know why? Collaborative divorce Excuse never makes it to court. It, 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 it intersects with family court never. So those people really go on with their lives and nobody ever knows, you know, anything about what they're doing because it was all completely confidential. They weren't involved with the court. It's kind of amazing. Like I, I deal with family court almost never when in my personal practice. Now my law firms, we have multi -fa multiple facets of, of lots of different things. And I, in the past, I have had lots of interactions with family court, but I almost never have to deal with it now because my clients are settling all of their disputes in my conference room. They never ever see the inside of a courtroom ever through their entire process. So for our viewers, kind of walk through the process. So someone comes in, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing a couple or someone reaches out and says, hey, we, we want to settle this. We want to work with this. We want to yeah. keep it out of court. So how does that process work? Do both sides have attorneys? Is it, do you hire a mediator? What's the process look like? So, yes, people reach out now um, before, it, you know, the marketing wasn't there for people to be Googling collaborative divorce, right? They were just looking for divorce in general. And then, um, you know, so we would advertise for divorce in general so people could come to us and understand so we could build this level of awareness. Now people come directly looking for a healthy divorce, an amicable divorce, how to separate without 
controversy. That's what people are kind of looking for um, a lot more now than ever before. And I think it's because of the great work that we're doing, which is awesome. But so now people are trying to kind of figure out how to stay out of court. And so one or the other client will contact. You can actually in a lot of states. And again, I'm going to go ahead and give my disclaimer now, which is very important. I am an attorney in the state of North Carolina. I cannot tell anybody about their rights in any other state. I am also not giving any legal advice, even if you do live in the state of North Carolina tonight. So um, <laughs> it will also be in the description of all the videos. <laughs> awesome. So um, I've done so many of these now with the bar and everything. I just is so much better to be very poignant. But um, so, you know, when we're dealing with this, it's an incredibly interesting situation. And in North Carolina, we want to make sure that um, that everybody is able to have access to a fair to a fair system. And in, if you stay out of court, you have a lot more access to that because you have a lot more control over what you're doing. And so House Bill 186 is the shared parenting bill that we have here in North Carolina. Um, but when someone comes in and they're looking for collaborative family law, they're able to uh, have a joint orientation sometimes. So in a lot of states, um, as long as you're not giving legal advice, you can sit down with two people and talk to them about process options. So you have essentially five paths. You can go through litigate in North Carolina, litigation, mediation, uh, settlement, negotiation, collaborative, or you can be pro se. So essentially those are like all of your options. Um, and two people can sit down and kind of hear that together. That's a good thing if they do. They don't always have to. You can still have it individually. And then a letter sent to the other person inviting them to hire a collaborative attorney and join the collaborative process. In North Carolina, we have a nonprofit organization called NCCAN. That's nc-can.org. And it has uh, all of the collaborative attorneys in the state of North Carolina. So it's just informational resources for about collaborative for people who are going through divorce. Has a map of all the attorneys so that p both parties can find it. Like one, one spouse can send to the other spouse and say, hey, check out this website. I'd really like for us to do this in a way where we can be fair to each other. And so that conversation's hard at first, right? Like you're, if you go through litigation, you're about to have a V in the middle of your name, like a boxing match. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, you don't necessarily think, oh, I should reach out to the person on the other side of the V and see if we can do this together. But that is one of the most important decisions that you will ever make because the process that you get into for your divorce will make the difference for the rest of your life after, you know, the whole point of divorce is to reset your life. And so if you choose the wrong process, then, and sometimes it's not your choice. If the other person chooses mm -hmm. litigation, you can't do collaborative. Both people have to choose. Both parties to hire an attorney. Everybody sits together in a conference room. All four people, a pledge is signed that says that neither one of those attorneys are going to take the other person to litigation. That creates what's called the container. That container, we just kind of name it that because it's like a safety container. You can you don't have to worry that whatever you say in there is going to be brought up in litigation. If you're cross exam you're never going to be cross examined by that attorney. Everything is confidential. It's part of settlement negotiations. Most states, North Carolina does have laws that protect settlement negotiation from being brought up in litigation. Um, it dissuades people from leaving it because you do have to go hire another attorney if you decide that you want to go to litigation. But at any moment you can, you never give up your right to go to litigation. It just allows you to come to the table and avoid what is called the telephone game. I mean, when we were in grade school, we all played the telephone game where you whisper to the next person and it goes all the way around the room. And by the time it gets back, you said butterflies are beautiful and they come up with um, San Francisco is the place that I'd like to travel to, you know, and it's and you're like, what? Where did that even come from? That happens a lot whenever a client talks to an attorney, that attorney talks to the other attorney, the attorney then talks to their client. I mean, do we really think that the first conversation is going to go through two attorneys who are against each other and come back to the other spouse in whatever format was said when you can literally just call that person that you probably had kids with and build an entire life with? and say what you need to say directly. If we cut that level of communication off, things start to, to fall down. And what that means is more money in attorney's fees, a longer amount of time that you're gonna have to spend negotiating, more issues that you're gonna be exposing your children to potentially. Um, and so, you know, that's the point of collaborative is to try to insulate people out of court. I mean, judges want you to do it too. They give you these long spiels before you go to litigation or say, this is your last chance to settle. I'm never going to know as much about your life as you do. Um, and it alleviates the docket and allows people to uh, maintain the control over their lives and over their children and over their finances.
Yeah, I, I will say that the telephone game is not something that I necessarily was aware of. I, w- I was trained as a labor and employment attorney. Like everybody sits down at the table and hammers out the labor agreement. Like the CEOs of both companies or, or the president of the union or whatever are sitting there across from each other and know what's said. And you look at it, some of these people, uh, my own personal case, I've taken new clients on where it's like, we have an honest conversation with the other side. And I tell them, hey, this is what they're offering. And they're like, oh, they were, we, we were, I was told it was a 180. Like it was the opposite side because we go into these situations. And like you said, the V, the boxing match. In, in okay. California, um, when it's marriage, they put and. I don't know if that makes it any better. So you get the really? and symbol between, yeah, you get the and symbol between them. Um, but at least on the court, the, the video boards outside the courtrooms, they, they, oh, okay. they, put, the, they put the and on there. I was going to uh, say that is very progressive for California. <laughs> yeah. Uh, especially in the family courts. But I think that the biggest thing, I, I don't, I don't know if anyone has the perfect answer and I don't think there's any one answer to fix family courts, but I always tell people there needs to be some system in place that removes kind of takes down the armor yeah that there's some sort of mediation there's something where it's not immediately um immediately combative because i I think i i know individuals who are in the state of north carolina where dv has been weaponized or alleged substance abuse it happens all the time here in california so in terms of it sounds like collaborative divorce is growing in north carolina and more people are becoming aware of it so what would you say the percentage of people right now that they go through the collaborative process and they're done uh, versus the people who don't come to resolutions? And where do you see collaborative fitting in in the state of North Carolina, say, over the next five to 10 years? Uh, I think it's going to become the new norm. I think we're going to flip the lake. That's what we'd call it um, to where people choose collaborative and the outlier is litigation, which is the appropriate way that that should be. Um, yeah. You know, the family is not built to be in litigation. Litigation was created in our country to make you whole when you have been wronged or damaged in civil court. Or if you're in criminal, to pay society for what you have done to our society. So neither one of those contexts does a family fit in. And that's why we have an issue is because it doesn't belong there unless there's an outlier issue. So if everybody would go and gravitate to an alternative dispute resolution process, I think that it would make a huge difference for children across the country. And so what is your discussion? So as this practice area grows, and let's be honest, attorneys are at the end of the day, business people. Yes. When do you have attorneys come to you and say, "What's the deal with this collaborative? What what are, what's kind of attorneys' reception to this as this becomes more well known and more <laughs> accepted?" Well, at first, whenever I started my practice as a female too, and I you know I started my law firm straight out of law school because I believed in collaborative. I never did litigation. I went straight to collaborative and started my law firm, and people were like are you crazy? This is like brand new law and you're moving to a brand new part of the state and you're just going to like introduce a new concept and also also just start a law firm. And I was like, yeah. And I mean, honestly, I think I, in retrospect now, how long I've been in business, I'm like, no wonder all these people were looking at me like I was crazy. Like all the things I was literally just like, yeah, I'm just going to trailblaze through every single demographic issue. Like it's just kind of crazy. But, um, but it really, people were drawn to it because it's easily marketable. It is faster. It's uh, generally, I can't guarantee any results. It's faster. It's um, cheaper. It's less emotional distress. And you have more control over the process. I mean, there's really not like a negative thing about it. I think that um, attorneys now are starting to see. So at first they would kind of pat me on the head and be like, oh, that's so cute. Like, we're so excited for your new little practice. And I was like, mm, okay, watch me. And, um, and now they're all getting the training, but the, this is the unfortunate part. And this is what you have to be very careful. Everybody who is watching this, listen to me right now. When you are sitting in front of attorney, make sure that their interests are aligned with yours. If this person gives you a bad vibe that you should listen to that because you know, that's what happens. You have to realize who is actually looking out for you and who's not, because there are people who realize that there's a lot of money to be made off of increased conflict. And unfortunately, they gravitate towards that. You have to be very aware that if you settle outside of court, 
there is, you're not, the increased animosity is not going to make somebody else more money. Yeah, you don't. And, and, and I found the, the biggest thing is I hate putting either party on the stand or having any witnesses testify because, I mean, we all know both our states have best interest of the child as the standard. It weaponizes any and everything. Mm-hmm. Oh, he used to spank the kid with the belt. Oh, well, you used the spatula and your sandal. Um, that was how, you, but all of a sudden there's seven CPS complaints and you're on the stand trashing them. How are you going to be able to co-parent with that person? Exactly. And, and that kind of transitions. One of the things, so I got a copy, I got a chance to, uh, read, uh, her book this week. Uh, it's, it's short. It's an, it's a very easy read. A lot of really, really good information. The, the cure for divorce culture. And one, one of the sections in there, you talk about, it's never too late to co-parent. So I think every single family law attorney, no matter the nature of their practice, they get very, very bitter parents coming in uh, to their office. And it's, I've been slighted. The kid's been withheld. They did this. They're not giving me this. What What is your best advice in terms of moving from a relationship where it's negative and it's going to impact the child or children to a more positive co-parenting relationship. All right. The holidays are about to come up. So let's just use this as a reference. Aunt Bertha pissed you off five years ago with something that she said. By Christmas five, you're not as mad at Aunt Bertha anymore. You're just really not. You don't care. There's been five years of life that's happened in between then and now. I mean, just think about your own life and people that have entered into your life where they rubbed you the wrong way at some point in time or some massive thing went down, maybe even with a coworker. Uh, generally, though, in families, that's a good context to think about it because these are people you have to spend you know, the rest of your life with if they're your family. And so, um, and if you have kids, Kids. That's unfortunately what you're kind of signing up for. And so lifetime you know, contract, it, it is. And so if you just allow yourself to when you realize that it's maybe you were real hyped up about it in the moment and things were really bad then, but we're way down the road now. Right. And, and it, it might have been terrible. I mean, it may have been absolutely terrible, but we're down the road now. And, and you may, you find yourself like not caring as much, not being as mad, but you feel like, you know, you can't really go back and just offer that little olive branch. Just try, just do it. See what happens. It won't, it's not going to hurt you to see what happens. If the other person does not accept, then fine, but it is never too late. So over time, parents are going to start to realize these statistics and what's happening. And, they're, and the children themselves, I have so many adult children of divorce that come to me off of this book and off of my research and are like, how do I open this conversation up with my parents to basically be like, what the heck? You know, mm-hmm. that's essentially what they're going to come to say, especially because a lot of these children in their college programs just through like life classes or if they're in criminal justice or political science are finding their parents' court orders and reading them as, you know, somewhat adults in life in college. That's not a pleasant conversation. It's just not. So over time, parents are going to start to realize this and naturally they're going to start to give those olive branches later in life, maybe around grandchildren number one. You know, like way down the road, they're able to finally be like, let's do this right from today forward. And do this right means this. It is very simple. This is the answer. You have to respect the parent that is the other parent of your child. That's all you've got to do. You just have to respect them. That means two things. When you're talking about them in front of your child, you have to be respectful. And when you're talking about them to anybody else except for your spouse or close, close family members where you can truly say what's on your mind, you do not say bad things about them. If you will do that, your children will be so much better. Because when they hear you saying that, they think you're talking about them. Because when they look in the mirror, they see that aspect of their parent inside of them. And they think, that you're talking about them. I've been that child. I've heard this story. I've heard from more from adult children of divorce than I think anybody else has. And I'm trying to be the microphone to say, and I'm a parent now myself. And I, you know, want to, I just want people to hear me be the microphone for these kids and what they say to me when they're in their twenties and thirties and starting their own families. You know, my parents did not get invited to my wedding. They have not met my child. 
you know, because of the level of conflict that I was exposed to, the only way that I can protect my family is to have that removed. And they know that it's not because I'm mad at them. It's just because it's so toxic. I can't be involved in it. And I don't, and it, it hurts my parents and I don't want other people to have to deal with that. And it hurts me. I can't even begin to explain to you what it feels like to get married and have a kid and not have either of your parents there and both of them still be living in on this planet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's definitely, uh, definitely something. And I think, I think one of the things I've seen, and I'm, I'm curious to see if you see this in your practice is that the younger the couples are, the more likely they're going to make concessions, the more likely they're going to be able to come to agreements. I see a lot of times you get clients, I get clients who they're 40, 50 years old, and they can't agree on anything because the dad's heard something about shared parenting, but the mom, hey, mom knows best, dad gets every other weekend at best. Where if I have a 24 year old come in, they almost always say, I want to do 50 50. And usually the mom's not too far off of that unless there's some like DV allegations. Do you see that in the collaborative sphere too? Is it easier to work with younger people? I think that we are entering into a new generation of people who just like, you know, myself um, are adult children of divorce and they don't want to put their kids through what they went through. And they're, you know, they're like, yes, we have to compromise here because that's what this is about because my parents didn't do that and I want to do it different so that my kids don't deal with what I dealt with because the fact that I'm here and divorcing is actually part of the statistic, you know, like you're 200% more likely to get divorced if one of your parents, if one of the couple, if their parents are divorced, you're 200% more likely to get divorced. It's kind of crazy. That is, uh, well, I guess that, that speaks to uh, breaking the chain that exactly. the, these, these different things, they, they occur generation after generation. Exactly. And I mean, think about it though. Children model us. That's how we teach them to talk. That's how we teach them to eat. That's how we teach them to walk. So if you're handling a conflict situation, they're going to model how you're handling conflict and they're going to then do that later in life. So when you're the biggest thing that I say, this is your litmus test any situation that you're handling, do what you wish your kids would do if they were in that same situation. It's fair. That, I think that's a good uh, good guidepost for, for any parent going through the system. So I want to bring this up. I know we're going to do questions at the end here, but I think Lamont made a really good comment. And I think there's a question based off of it. So essentially ADR should be something that is, is mandatory, but both parties have to agree to it and that is not going to happen. So when someone comes in your office and there, there are so many benefits to going the collaborative way and one parent is very hesitant, what do those conversations look like? What can that parent that, that wants to be more collaborative do to help get that other parent on board? So that's why we created, uh, so that's why we have NC Can in North Carolina. So you can like send, it's not like you're sending, this is my attorney's website. Look at how amicable we are. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because the other cl the other spouse is going to be like, oh, I bet you are amicable. You know, that's kind of because of the culture of divorce in America. So if you have like something like an NPO or a resource where you can send that's like a non-biased resource, NC Can is that because it's a nonprofit organization. It's not my website or any of the other collaborative attorneys' websites. It's a different website. So people can read it together. That, that website and that uh, organization has no interest in, you know, whether or not they hire an attorney. They're just trying to provide good information. So try to find something like that and send it along. One thing that clients do is they just stop talking to the other person. Well, then their only sphere of influence is now their attorney. Why did you do that? Just keep yourself very civil and anything that you write, you want to make sure that you are happy for a judge to read it out loud in open court. Just keep that as your test. I mean, you can be super nice and be like in your mind kind of condescending about it, but everything that you're saying be super nice. You can still do that. Keep all of that communication above board, but stay in communication. Say, hey, we don't need to spend this level of money. We don't need to expose our kids to this. Think with me right now. We did. We took these vows together at some point or we decided at some moment that we really enjoyed each other to the point that we had children something's got to be somewhere in your mind that can say, hey, let's think about this. Are we are we being a, a piece of the system or are we making these decisions? And and that's a big part of it is if that communication completely breaks down, 
then these two people are only hearing from their attorneys. They're never having commonsensical conversations about their actual family together. And that's not good. That doesn't help to resolve the issues. Yeah, definitely. I, I tell my clients two things about, or I put three up here because I have three bullet points on the first one, but brief, extremely positive and directly about the child. Yes. And then I ask them if they've either been arrested or they've watched a movie where someone's got arrested. Everything can and will be used against you in a court of law. Yes. <laughs> um, those, those are the two. That, that comes out in the first 20 minutes of anything you've said is 100% going to go in front of the judge. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and, and I, got, I got a couple people asking what the title of your book is. So we want to get that to them. It's The Cure for Divorce Culture. And uh, where's the best place for everyone who's asking about it to get it? Probably Amazon. I mean, you can, Amazon's going to be the best place to get it. You can also get it through my website at anrlaw.com, but like shipping and all that is going to be faster through Amazon. Gotcha. Okay. So everybody's got that. So um, one of the, and I guess this is something that that I'm curious about and something that I've always said, like I said, we don't know all of the answers, but do you see a situation where right now, obviously there's a lot of talk. We had Arkansas this past year. We have several states. We have over a dozen states. Now they're going to have 50, 50 legislation. Do you see a world in my mind, this collaborative process has a place pre litigation, no matter what, mm -hmm. do, what do you, what do you see the optimal family yes. court system, even for high conflict B? Well, right now in North Carolina, there's mandatory mediation for custody. So if you file mm -hmm. a custody action, you absolutely have to go to mediation. Is it like that in California? Yes. Yeah. There's mandatory mediation. It's a joke, but there's mandatory mediation okay. for any request for order. So that's, that is mandatory for collaborative. I absolutely think that it's going to become, you know, the thing that people select because it allows them to stay outside of court, but they don't have to go through the full collaborative process. And please note the collaborative process has varying different options. So some people think it's this whole process where you have to have a child specialist and a financial neutral and two attorneys. You have to hire all these people. You don't have to do that. The, the simplified collaborative process is just the two attorneys and the two clients sitting in a room together. And that could also be on a Zoom conference. We were doing Zoom way before Zoom was a thing, by the way, in collaborative. So <laughs> very, you know, the thing that I will say about collaborative is that it is evolved. It is evolved divorce. The whole reason everybody sits in a room together is to avoid the telephone game. So we can just have direct conversations, get to the point, make some decisions, get an agreement done and get over it, you know, move on. I know that there are a ton of emotions involved. I am divorced myself. I am a child of divorce. I fully understand that it is very intense, but all that work needs to be done at home and in the mirror. That's where that work needs to be done. You need to, this is a business transaction. You need to get through this so that you can take care of yourself mentally and emotionally so that you can take care of your children mentally and emotionally. And if you're in the middle of this for an extended amount of time, your brain is going to start to cycle. It's just, it's part of the chemistry of how our brain is made up in dealing with conflict. This is not, this is not anything bad about any individual person. This is just human nature and how best to deal with conflict. And so now that people are starting to become more aware of conflict resolution possibilities outside of litigation, they're going to start naturally selecting that they already are because they see okay, I have more control of this process. It's going to cost me less money. I'm going to be able to get through this faster. At the end of the day, yes, it does mean that it has to be voluntary on both sides. Are we there right now? No. I would say about half of the people have woken up. Well, that means there's this whole other half of people who have not. Is that going to continue to change over time? Yes. Is it going to happen right now? No, it's not. It's a pendulum. It has to swing. Right now, it went all the way, and it's got to come all the way back. You know, And that's just kind of where, that's where we're at. I'd say... That over the last 10 years, I've, had, I've been doing this. Um, I opened my law firm straight out of law school a decade ago, and the first one. Um, and so I've been doing this for 10 years. And since I have been doing this, every single year, the ratio of collaborative cases to litigation cases across all my firms, I only do collaborative, goes up. That is amazing. And, and so... I, got, I, I think this is probably a question a lot of people have. And if you go down in many states, I, I went and looked. I, didn't, I don't know the exact number. Like I said, California, I had no idea, has very similar language. It's kind of hidden away. It's not readily available, but very similar language around laws 
dealing with collaborative divorce. How long does, would you say the average case, like what is that? So you, you mentioned, you said they come in and they may do it together. They may do a separate kind of the bare bones is each side has an attorney. You mm-hmm. sign an agreement. Everything's in the container. Everything is everything that's said in that room and that zoom, whatever is there and there forever and never comes out. So how long does, does the collaborative process usually take? Four to six months. Four to six months. So to be done with everything, custody, mm-hmm. child support, equitable distribution, alimony, literally the whole entire thing. You know, in North Carolina, you have to be separated for a year to get divorced. So yeah. I'm not talking about the actual vital records formality of a divorce. I'm talking about the anything involved in a marriage can be 100 percent resolved. Generally, on average, the cases take four to six months. And the four to six months really is only because of the scheduling of the client's schedule, you know, like mm-hmm. not because it couldn't have been it couldn't have happened faster. I mean, um, I think that I've always you know, there's a there's the thing called divorce hotel. I don't know if you've heard about it, but I truly believe that if I just opened up, went to a hotel for a weekend and had a bunch of different attorneys, collaborative attorneys and a bunch of different spouses all staying there. We could finalize everything for them in two days, a Saturday and a Sunday. I truly believe that we could spend. They could have a piece of paper that lays everything out that's ready to be submitted to the courts. Yes. In that short time. And in a lot of states in California, I mean, it's, it's four to five months before you get an initial hearing. Uh, Yeah. So that's, that's pretty amazing. So, and part of that is the discovery process, you know, is immediate. When you have your first session, everybody hands over all the documents or before that we've had a Dropbox opened up where all the documents are put in and everybody gets that. So then you have a binder or you have a Google drive folder that has everything for this. You're about to start your life over again. Isn't it awesome to have everything that you have had in one place and then you're able to kind of figure out what you need to do in order to organize your life forward. That's another thing about collaborative. We do budgets. We have spreadsheets. Everything's on the computer. You, everyone can see exactly what's fair. What's 50 50. If we move this here, what does that do to the ratio? It, everything's just open and it's very transparent and it allows people to feel comfortable. Even mm-hmm. though it's a very uncomfortable situation, the transparency allows for comfort. Yeah, no, no one, no one feels like the the other party's trying to pull a fast one on them. Exactly, because there's no reason to, right? The attorneys don't make any more money if it goes on. You know, it's we we don't make money out of off of there being high levels of conflict in this situation. Also, we're sitting in the room with them, so we want to help them through conflict. It, it's not comfortable to just sit swimming in conflict with two people who absolutely despise each other for two hours. Mm. You know, that's what we commit ourselves to do. Yeah, I don't think that, most people knowing what they and their spouse get into would want to electively go into someone else's relationship and like just enjoy that with them for two hours. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that I, I'm sure it's fulfilling when when the challenging cases come and yes. you come to a resolution. But in, in the moment, it's uh, it, it's, it's probably sometimes we all different. cry because we've been through so much. We're just like, yes, it is over. <laughs> But they do all come to resolution. I want that to be noted. Some people are afraid. They're like, well, then if it ends and then I have to go hire a litigation attorney, that almost does not happen. There are few cases that do not settle. I personally do not have one case where the two people did not eventually reach a resolution. So it is slim that that actually happens. Does it happen? Yes. I cannot guarantee you, and I don't guarantee anything, but I cannot guarantee you that if you go to collaborative, you are 100% going to settle your collaborative case. I will say that it is way more likely than not that you are going to settle your case there. Um, And I think that, you know, everybody should truly just look into it, make sure that you know what you're doing. You have just make an informed decision. You should be playing a chess game. You should be sitting upright. You should be looking down at the board. You should be thinking about the other person and what they're doing and what you're doing to advance your next move three moves ahead. That's what you should be doing. You need a 20,000 foot view. You do not need to be hugging the tree, staring at the ants on the tree. Do not do that. Back up. Mm-hmm. And and with, with such a high success rate, do you, what, do you, typically see people it's like hey we we want to have some form of shared parenting maybe not agreeable on 50 50 is and 
it's like, hey, we're, we're going to just divide the assets in half. Like, is that the typical? Do you, what percentage would you say come in like high conflict where they see nothing the same way? I'd say almost all, I mean, lots of parents come in wanting more than half time. You know, I think mm -hmm. <laughs> just as a parent, don't you just naturally want to have your children more? I think almost all the time I have someone come in and say, I think I'd like to have primary custody. And I'm like, let's talk about what that means for your child down the road. Let's look at statistics. Why don't you do your research? Just do, you know, read these articles, look at this psychology stuff, um, chat with your own therapist. You know, it's, I'm not the end all be all of information. In fact, I'm just a conduit of a bunch of research. That's really obvious. Like, I don't even have to be like, hey, please listen to me. All I have to do is say, please read these bukus of articles and research that we just now have. I don't want anybody to feel bad. We just now started figuring all this out. We just now have enough information to figure out what's happening in family court, what's happening to kids, what's happening to adults. You know, we just now have this stuff. So it's just natural that now would be the time that we're figuring out how to change this. Yeah, I think that's the thing. And we we talked about it briefly about my one of my initial conversations with Don, um, who's the executive director of National Parents Organization, who said in the late 90s, early 2000s, shared parenting was this extreme concept. And I think in my practice on the day to day, it's individuals who usually cause the biggest issues are the parents, the grandparents who are open to reading that type of literature. Right. Uh, but I think over time, I mean, this is kind of like, there are lots of things when you're a parent that becomes some almost like kind of a guilt trip if you don't do it right. Like there are lots of trends that happen in every generation of parenting. I do believe eventually there's going to be enough information out there that parents are going to naturally not want to be exposing their children or themselves to that. Yeah. I got a good question here. I, I guess this hadn't even crossed my mind. So um, Todd asks, what about when children are involved? I, I'm taking this to mean like say in the state of California, when a child turns 14, they have a right to have their voice heard by the courts. Um, uh, going through the collaborative divorce process, say they have older children, 12, 14, 16 Even younger year children, we get their voice though. So uh, child special. So the true collaborative process has a child specialist and a financial neutral. If you get the full collaborative process, you uh -huh. can choose which of those that you want those extra people, but you have to have the two attorneys. A child specialist does this, and this is how we know so much information about what the children are hearing from their parents is because the child specialist meets with the children themselves. And, and, it, the, and due to confidentiality issues and other things, uh, the children understand that because they're minors, their parents are entitled to have most of that information, but they're able to kind of open up because the setting is very calming. And then these people are professionals. They know how to be able to talk to children and make them feel comfortable so that they can communicate. And they're not asking them direct questions. It's just in general conversation and then things will mm -hmm. come out. A lot of things have come out about conversations like these children can give depicted detailed conversations that their parents had the night before in their bedroom where they can like regurgitate verbatim how that conversation mm -hmm. went down and they'll give that to the child specialist and the child specialist just comes into the conference as the voice of the children that's all they are parents are sitting there they're negotiating back and forth all of a sudden the child specialist will say what i heard you say was this and they'll like regurgitate that conversation and the parents are like how did you hear that you know, because they're allowing the parents to see that the, how the children are affected and what the children are actually perceiving. And then they can talk about how the children feel about stability, how they feel about one house or another, how they feel about, and not that children need to be the decision makers, because when they're children, the, the adults are supposed to be the decision makers. This is just more information so that you're able to make a decision. Does one person live in another state? Do we have two people in two different states? You know, how mm -hmm. does the child feel about that? The back and forth, one week on, one week off. Would they prefer to have two, two, three or some other format or schedule? You know, and, and those types of things can come out. So the children can talk to the child specialist and be a part of the collaborative conference that way. Gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. So, so children in the full form of collaborative divorce law, really no matter their age, once they communicate, if have custody is an who is issue, 
yes, if custody is an issue, if the parents come in agreeing, obviously, why are the children going to have to meet with somebody? Yeah, definitely. So I had a question. This is actually from a fellow attorney. Sean's an attorney in Washington state. So what about courts using coercive power to force people to use a collaborative process to address uh, at least some issues? Um, so I think coercive probably a little strong on the language, but like <laughs> what, what would your thoughts be on uh, – on its face, I, I'm like, this This may work. What, what are your thoughts on, do you think the collaborative process is something that maybe it could be worked in where you're going through litigation and the judge can say, no, you two need to go work outside of the courts to solve this specific issue? Two things there. One, please note, if you are in litigation and you can talk to the other person or have somebody reasonably talk to the other person and you decide you want to go to collaborative, you can file what is called a collaborative stay. And you can stay all time frames of litigation and then go to collaborative and try it. And if it works, they get then you dismiss the case and file your collaborative agreement. If you want to file it in court, if you don't, if you want to keep it as a contract, you just you finalize the case. Your attorney can tell you how that will happen in your state. But do know that in a lot of states that have collaborative statutes, they have an ability for you, if you are in litigation, to stay litigation, go to collaborative. So a lot of things that judges do, the more they know about collaborative, the more they are asking clients. A lot of judges give their own spiel now before they actually have a hearing. And they'll say, this is your last opportunity. If you are considering at all collaborative mediation, please let us know right now. We can, we can file a stay. We can do this. We can do that. So some judges are doing that. It is my hope that that continues to happen, that, we, that there's more and more and more awareness and that people are able to understand and they're able to give that you know, push towards helping people to understand. But what I, I want everybody to know is I don't think the courts need to reform. I think people need to reform. I think that people elect to go to court to have people make decisions over their kids. I think you need to realize that this is America and you can make those decisions yourself because we have contract law. And so mm -hmm. that is, you know, in most states you can have a contract. Now, the court's always going to have the welfare of the children as one or the state. Each state is going to have the welfare of the children under its state as one of its powers. So you can go to the court and have them make a determination. But that does not mean that you have to. It does not mean that you have to. You know what I'm saying? Like people need to understand you do. You walk willingly into that. No one is is coming after you. Now, if you're being sued, obviously you're not walking willingly, but if you are deciding to go file a lawsuit, please think if you are doing that because you are electing to make that decision in almost all states in the United States of America, you do not have to go to court. Please look into that and know your rights. Okay. So they, there is in North Carolina, there's a mechanism where you can go down the road of litigation and decide, oh, it's, it's a mistake and actually back out into the collaborative process. Right. And so you can come into what's called a consent order and you can file that or you can have a contract outside of court. So if, if you feel better to have a court order that's enforced with the powers of the court, you can do that. If you pr prefer to have a confidential contract, you can do that. And so, um, and that's in the state of North Carolina, obviously. But I do just want people to understand that I don't necessarily think that we need to focus on trying to reroute the court system. The court system is designed to deal with high conflict, with people who cannot make a decision and who cannot understand. What we need to do is provide awareness so that people understand that they have all these other options before they have to go to court. And if they'll just try those options, naturally court will realign itself because it will naturally only be handling the cases that it needs to handle. And instead, all of the people will be choosing the things that they need to do before having to deal with court. Does that make sense? Like this is a reform of society, not necessarily mm -hmm. a reform of the court system. Yeah. And I, I'm taking it as someone who's kind of in the system every day. We, we see the younger, the in my, like I said, I said earlier, the younger, the client, the more progressive in their thought process, typically. Typically, if I have someone who's under the age of 25, it's usually a mom, a dad, an aunt, a grandma, or someone who gets in the way of, of some form of agreement. So it kind of sounds like we're probably on the same page on this. Yes. My opinion is that we're probably two generations away. Our 100%. grand, our grandchildren will not view divorce the same way. They will think we were in our professions were crazy. Yes. <laughs> So, that is happening guess, right now. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and I said, like, it's going to take because like, like yeah. I said, I see most of the time what gets in the way is 
an auntie, a grandma, a mom. It's usually it usually is the female, even to the to the male client, to the male or the female involved. It's usually one of their female influences that kind of sticks their nose in and says, "You shouldn't do that. You can't do that. Make the judge make a decision." Unfortunately, that's a lot. I counsel my clients a lot on restricting who they receive advice from because this is an individual experience. It is not a group experience. It's not a group project. Getting divorced is not a group project. Please hear me. Getting divorced I, is not a group project. It is not I you tell and my all clients, your besties. One person, one person who has no connection to the other party <laughs> and you tell them, I'm going to spill the beans to you or you go find a therapist. I say, yes. find a therapist. If you refuse to do that, you're going to go to one person, not a mutual friend, not someone who talks to them regularly. You're going to go to that one person and you're going to say through this process for my own sanity, I'm going to need to just spill the beans to you. I think that it's just important to realize that this is a journey. And if you're making a decision to get divorced or you're dealing with it, because not everybody's getting divorced. You could just be dealing with a child custody issue. But if you're dealing with that, then what you're hoping for is on the other side of this, I'm going to have this new space that's going to be more positive, more peaceful, more happy. You know, focus on that. If that is what you're trying to, to achieve, going into battle with someone, spewing all this negative energy onto someone or some situation is not going to help you get there. And I understand you may not have gotten yourself into litigation. Someone else may have sued you. That still means, though, you can control your own reaction to it and your own behavior about it and your own attitude about it. If you understand that it's a system and it is what it is and we're trying to reform it and it's a little broken right now and you didn't want to be there, but you found yourself there. If you try to like have those mental thought processes instead of everybody's out to get me, I understand it feels that way. And in some ways that in some cases that might be the case, but you have to keep your own air about it clean because that your children are picking up on it and it's important to mm -hmm. keep it together for them. You can have time and space and some person, like you said, a therapist, a friend, one person who truly has your best interest at heart to be able to speak to, but just, just be very careful because it is a very delicate situation. Use kid gloves. Yeah, that's, that's definitely something. So I'm only taking this question because I've actually seen some of your content where you talk about it and I know I'm comfortable talking about it. Um, so am I here? He, he's asking a question in regards to race. So uh, we haven't talked about this. My kids are mixed. My kids are, are part Hispanic, part black. Um, and so there I are. I just and, talked and, about racial injustice in child, in child support and child custody um, with uh, a speaking engagement I just had in Florida. So I actually just talked about all of this. I, I was going to say, I saw your content and this is something that, that I, 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 and I, I talk about quite frequently, and in my opinion, should the collaborative process, should any process involving the legal system uh, be sensitive to race? And I think the very short answer is yes. Um, I, I want all family law attorneys to be able to do collaborative and truly do it. You know, that way we can uh -huh. access everyone. Um, but so 100 percent, I would say, yes, I think that there need to be collaborative practitioners of all forms and fashions, so everybody can have access to this process. I will say my firm focuses a lot. We have an agreement with a, a nonprofit in North Carolina, and we do um, uh, initial consults at a reduced rate so that we can help give people, especially people of color, advice on how to access these systems and how to understand the systems if they don't have money to normally be able to buy or to be able to pay for uh, a, an initial consult for an attorney. Those are generally very expensive. And um, what we found is in child support specifically, um, you know, most of the people who owe child support make less than $10,000 a year, a year, mm -hmm. a year. Like there's, I think it's $155 billion of child support debt in America. Did you know that? Yeah. And a majority I, 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 of that I, 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 is I believe it's... It's it's more than there's more child support debt than student loan debt. Yes, I'm correct. Yes, and a and I can't remember the percentage of people who owe that debt who make less than ten thousand dollars a year. Like I just want to conceptualize like that level of, you know, if you're making less than ten thousand dollars a year, there are so many other things that you're trying to focus on just to make it survive, and then to especially with the inflation that we have today. And then to deal with, you know, that on top of it is just so incredibly unfair. So 
yes, I think that mm-hmm. race is a topic that needs to be discussed in family law. And I think, it, I think absolutely yeah. collaborative needs to be open to everybody. I think it's, it's a discussion that needs to be had because I think different segments, different cultures, these more progressive thoughts are, are more common. Um, I, I would say that probably about a third of my clients are white, a third of them are Hispanic, a third of them are black. And there are certain things that when I have that, that if it's an African-American man sitting in front of me, that they're going to believe about the system. They're going to think about the system um, compared to someone who's white is going to have certain thoughts. And so I think as advocates, um, really everyone watching this obviously is advocating for a better system. We need to be able to touch all segments of our population because there are certain segments that are getting serviced right now that are getting educated. And there are other segments that we're not doing a good job of educating those people, specifically educating those fathers, well, really mothers and fathers, of what is best for their children. And we're just creating an at-risk generation in some of those cultures, in some of those, those demographics. Yes. Children need access to both parents. It's incredibly important. All right. Awesome. So we're, we're closing in on an hour here tonight. So um, where can I gotta go everybody take care fi- of my baby? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so where can everybody find you online? Uh, website first. ANRlaw.com. And then where can they find you on social media? ANR Law. We make it pretty consistent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll keep it easy on that. So, um, Ashley, And then once there's again, the Divorce Healthy Podcast. Please, definitely, that's on all forms and formats of podcast. It's a very uplifting, positive, true scope of what's happened to, with divorce in America. How did we get here? Um, it will, you know, is a, is a great podcast to help you feel better about the circumstances that you're in and hope for the future as well. And I have to, I think I have to plug, um, Casey was on your show, the executive yeah. director. So, um, go down, go subscribe to her podcast, go check out Casey's episode and, and all the other episodes. Um, so once again, Ashley, thank you so much for coming on, uh, for all the viewers, we are off next week. It is Thanksgiving, but we will be back with Ryan McLaughlin from Minnesota the following week. So we'll see everybody in two weeks.